Welcome. It's so good to be with you on this Wednesday as we get together for a little midweek Bible study and devotional time. So glad that you've taken some time out of your day, out of your week, whenever it is that you're watching this, to join us and to uh, dive into God's Word and, and maybe look at what He has to say and hopefully be uplifted and, and challenged by His words to us and, and the call that the life that He calls us to live. And, and uh, again, I'm so glad that you've taken some time out of your week to, to join us to do just that. You know, there's a, a story in Matthew chapter 20 where um, and I, I don't won't tell the whole story, but basically, uh, one of the moms of two of Jesus' disciples come. To, she comes to Jesus and she asks uh, a, a kind of a presumptive request of Jesus about her son's place in his kingdom. Basically, that they would be right behind him in, in ranking order. Uh, and we won't get into all of the misconceptions about what the apostles and and and, and what they view Jesus' kingdom as and how that obviously changed once he gave his life and was resurrected from the dead. Uh, but in this moment, um, she asked this presumptive question. And not surprisingly, when Jesus' other disciples catch wind of what happened and the question that was uh, that was asked, they were, as, as this uh, text says, they were indignant. They were quite angry. They took exception to this question from the mom and, and, and her two sons. And it caused to, or it seems to cause this heated discussion uh, among the, the apostles. And so Jesus calls them together. And here's the point of the story. You can go read this, the story in Matthew chapter 20 to get the, the full context of it. But here's what I want to bring out uh, and, and flesh out in our, in our time together this evening. Jesus calls them together and he gives them some very challenging words and, and by extension, some us to us some challenging words. And he says to them in, in verses 25 through 28 of Matthew chapter 20, he says, you know, here, here's, the, here's the standard. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, they, they lord it over them. They, they, they let them know who's in charge, right? And, and, and everybody's got their place. Their high officials exercise authority over them. That's how the world works. Jesus says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Just as, and Jesus gives him, is himself as an example, just as the Son of Man, it's a term Jesus uses to describe himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I think it's easy sometimes to read statements like this, specifically Jesus' words here, to mean, you know, we know they have some some immediate context, but it's also easy to, to kind of think of this, this futuristic context to Jesus' words. And so, you know, we, we kind of apply it here in judgment. You know, when we stand before God, God in judgment, the greatest person is going to be determined by who has been the best servant. And so we make Jesus' words into some future promise as something to be recognized by God at the end of our lives, at the end of time. That, you know, and so we, we, we have that view. And so that way we can go ahead and, and strive for greatness by our own definition, right? Or, or by worse, by the world's definition of, of greatness. And so we, we can, we can kind of have our cake and eat it too. We can, we can have this futuristic view of, of what it means to be great. And then we can still have our worlds, or even, as I said, our own definition of what it means to be great in our right now, right? Jesus, however, defines greatness in our world, in our right now, in our lives on on this present earth, as being a servant to others. Greatness now is being a servant now, not just later when this world comes to an end. The greatest among us in our churches, our families, our communities— Jesus says are those who who serve sometimes quietly, sometimes without any fanfare, right, at all. They just serve to bless others and to honor their Savior by serving as he did. This promise isn't just a future tense reward. It is right now reality. Even though most in our world don't recognize, usually, those who serve, God does. God does. Sees. And he says, Jesus says, those servants are the great ones, not the ones who, who command huge stipends to speak, not those who, who stand before churches, you know, these huge churches and command great TV audiences. I'm not saying those are bad things, you know, but the, Jesus says that's, that's not what defines one as being great. The ones who are great, Jesus says, are the ones who quietly bless and care and toil and serve behind the scenes. Right now, those are the great ones. Speaking of, of that idea, it brings us to what we've been, we've been in a sermon series on, on uh, Sunday mornings uh, the last couple of weeks and, and we'll continue for the next couple of weeks called Encourage. 
And, and it's, you know, at the heart of that is, is, a, is a servant's heart, a, a humble heart. And, and I think about, what, you know, one of the people we talked about this past Sunday was a guy by the name of, of Onesiphorus. I, I, I love uh, Onesiphorus, and, and probably you may not have heard his name before today uh, or before this, this past Sunday. We really don't know much about him, in fact, in, in Scripture, so don't be too distraught about that uh, because there's a lot of people who haven't heard of him. And yet I think he is a great example of what Jesus is talking about here in Matthew chapter 20. I, I read something the other day recently where, where someone referred to, they were talking about uh, Onesiphorus, and they, they referred to him as a play on his name. And so instead of referring to him as Onesiphorus, which there's going to be a spelling test afterwards, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but instead of referring to him as Onesiphorus, they called him someone for us. Again, kind of a play on his name. And I like that because we all need someone like him, Onesiphorus, someone for us in our lives. And even more, there are people all around us who need us to be Onesiphorus for them, to be their someone for us, or someone, in this case, for them, friend. I think about the Apostle Paul and, and, and how we come to know about Onesiphorus, because in the Apostle Paul's darkest moments, during his imprisonment in Rome, facing what is probably going to be his death and ultimately would be, Onesiphorus was there for him. Paul describes his friend this way in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15-18. through 18. He says, You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, but may the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, because he often, I love this word, refreshed me, and he was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. If we're truly going to be great, I think Onesiphorus is a great example. Notice what he does. He, he was a refreshment to Paul, number one, when, when everyone else seems to be deserting Paul. He, he was a true friend in the toughest of times. Number two, he wasn't ashamed to be identified with Paul, even though Paul was facing death for his faith. You know, he, Onesiphorus wasn't just some fair weather friend, but he was a friend when it was even personally dangerous to him. He, he was a friend to Paul, even at great risk for his own personal livelihood. Uh, number three, Onesiphorus searched and worked hard to find Paul and to bless Paul. His service to Paul wasn't, you know, wasn't just some easy uh, attempt, but rather it required devoted attention and hard work, just not just some opportune moment that just popped into Onesiphorus's life. No, he had to work hard to find a place to serve Paul and go above and beyond. And the fourth thing I think we see is that he served Paul not just in the in the roughest times of, of Paul's life, but even in the day to day grind. I mean, we need to be there in both, right? His service to Paul was consistent and faithful through all circumstances, but then also especially during the roughest times of Paul's life. You know, one of the interesting things about Onesiphorus's greatness is that he is very little known, right? Even among Christians. He's not really held up as as this hero of faith as as others are that we read through scripture. You know, like like the Apostle Paul, although I guess the Apostle Paul probably would have argued that that uh Onesiphorus was in fact a hero of the faith that we ought to hold up. And perhaps that's because, you know, so often we, we think of these grand servants of God that we read about in Scripture who make this world of difference like the Apostle Paul, and we think that's that's what makes up greatness, you know, that, 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 we, that we have these, these huge worldwide impacts. And, and certainly I don't want to discount those people who have walked into those spaces and done amazing things. Those are, those are certainly to be lauded and commended for their, their hard work and their dedication and their sacrifice. But maybe the Apostle Paul would, would tell us that without people in his life, like Onesiphorus, he wouldn't have been the world changer that he was. Instead, perhaps he would have been someone who died alone, without his friends around him, and with much more limited mission. Again, Jesus said greatness must mean service. So maybe the question for us is not so much, who do I want to be? And, and, and this great view of, of, of what you know, God you know, can, can do through me. And that, again, nothing wrong with having that. But instead, maybe it's more like, who has God put in my life who needs an Onesiphorus? A, a someone for us friend. Because greatness is at our fingertips, but it's not found in pursuing some self-aggrandizing version of greatness or even just some more recognizable and maybe some more front and center type of greatness. But rather, according to Jesus, true greatness is found 
in the hands and the heart of a servant. Servants like Onesiphorus. Hope you have a blessed day. God bless.